It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Tara Harden, DDS, an award-winning owner of Harden Advanced Dentistry in Mason, Ohio. She has been practicing with her father, Dr. Gary Harden, for the past 15 years. She is one of only 359 dentists worldwide who are accredited members of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. In 2015, she was named one of the top 25 women in dentistry by Dental Products Reports. She is also a member of the Academy of General Dentistry, the ADA, Ohio Dental Association, Cincinnati Dental Society, and several other sleep organizations. She devotes countless hours of continued education on facial aesthetics, cosmetic dentistry, TMJ therapy, and sleep apnea. She lectures on laser dentistry and is a key opinion leader for Philips Sonicare. Dr. Tara graduated from Furman University with a Bachelor of Science degree in 96 when she played college tennis for the Lady Platins for four years. She then attended Ohio State University where she received her doctorate of dental surgery in 2000. She continued her passion for advanced training at the Las Vegas Institute for Advanced Dental Studies, earned a fellowship with LVI. In addition to operating a flourishing full-time practice, Dr. Tara is the mother of three young children, Lily and nine, Carson eight, and Carla five years old. By balancing her professional and personal life, she remains active in such outreach initiatives as Pink Ribbon Girls, JDRF, the American Heart Association, and Make-A-Wish Foundation. Hundreds of hours of continued education each year keep Dr. Tara Harden and her team among an elite class of dentists who provide exceptional aesthetic and restorative dentistry. Dr. Tara Harden and her staff at Harden Advanced Dentistry will give you the smile you've always wanted. Her specialties are cosmetic and family dentistry, dental implants, porcelain veneers, smile makeovers, same day crowns, sedation dentistry, dentures, Invisalign, sleep apnea, teeth whitening. Harden Advanced Dentistry is Cincinnati's premier dental practice offering patients the latest technology in comfortable spa-like atmosphere. She's a dentist that is very passionate about smile makeovers. It is just an honor to have you on the show today. Thanks so much for uh, accepting my invitation. Well, thank you for asking. Oh my gosh. So, uh, so your dad's a dentist, your mom's a hygienist. Does that mean your three daughters are biologically cursed to become a dentist? Well, I have a son. My, my son is Carson in the middle. Okay. And, uh, you know, I tell them all the time, <laughs> they say, oh my gosh, mom, how do you do what you do? But um, yeah, dentistry has been a wonderful career. I knew I was going to the dental office with my dad at the age of nine before you had to wear gloves and suctioning for him. On, on holidays, Christmas Eve, he, he never, he couldn't say no, ever. Hey, well, you know, that's a good segue for a question. As, as a, um, you know, when I was in dental school, there were hardly any women dentists. Now the dental schools are, are over half women. And a lot of women dentists in dental school um, come to a fork in their own. They say, okay, I want to have three kids just like you did. But what's easier to be, I mean, they want to be a super mom. They want to be a super dentist. If I want to be a super mom, is it easier to work at like Heartland Dental Monday through Friday, eight to five, so I don't have to worry about any of the business? Or is it easier to be a super mom if I own my own business? I have to say that um, I love owning my own business and being in control of my own destiny and making choices about my practice. But I, I think being a part of a DSO is is an easier road to take. And, um, you know, worrying about the building and the facility I operate in and who's paying the bills and the parking lot didn't get de-iced this weekend. So we had issues there. And, you know, buying my own supplies and having to control everything is you don't realize it's all the little things that add up when you're trying to be a mom and get out of the office at 3.30 to take them to tennis practice or or soccer, um, wherever they need to be, it's 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 really tough. So without help, it's I would say it, it has challenges. I was really lucky. I, 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 I had four boys, and after school, they would just walk down to the bar and start drinking, and then after work, I would just meet them at the bar. So maybe, maybe it was different well, for that, me. So so sounds um, like. It. So That's you different. you started LVI really early. I mean, you were uh, you were the first class with LVI with Ron Jackson when you were a second year dental student. Would you say that was your first major pivot was to own go into practice with your dad and then um, start off with LVI to be a cosmetic dentist? Is that kind of your foundation, cosmetic dentistry? It really became my passion when I was when I had my first round of ortho. And I, they took my braces off and I looked in the mirror and I thought, oh my gosh, I felt pretty for the first time in my life. When my smile, I had, my teeth came in every which way but straight. 
and I had a big gap between my front teeth. My canines came in, um, you know, way up top and everything just was the wrong way. It was, it was not good. And the orthodontist took my brackets off and I looked in the mirror and I thought, this is amazing. I had refused dentistry almost because my parents, you know, they were working Saturdays, one Saturday a month. They were working Wednesdays, every Wednesday late. I thought, I never want to do that. And uh, after I got my braces off, that's when I said, I, I'm going to do dentistry. So that's when it became my passion, really. And it's the aesthetic piece I just, I love because it's, you know, not everything is a full mouth or a, even, you know, of the, not everything is even veneers. I mean, sometimes just whitening someone's teeth, maybe even reshaping, doing some enamelplasty on a few teeth, you can't believe, or doing a few bondings, the, the difference you can make in someone's smile. So, when, And it, it changes your changes your personality in your life. When, when I read uh, that you're one of only 359 dentists worldwide, accredited members of the American Academy of Cosmetic Industry, you're a fellow in the American. Is, is that a typo on my part? Is it, is it one of 359 Well, you, re fellows? you must have read, yeah, I just became a fellow beginning of December. So I don't know, the information wasn't updated. So well, I'm the, well, actually the, 80, the 80, 82nd fellow. You're the 82nd so fellow and the 359th accredited members or, or one of 359. So wow, yeah. you're one of the first 100 fellows of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. How damn cool is that? It's pretty cool. I was I was really excited. It was a lot of work and, you know, working with the great labs in the country and just doing your best and taking great photography. And it's 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 definitely my greatest accomplishment thus far. Well, let, well, let's talk other than my family, uh, other, other than your family. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. My, my family. I always thought my uh, kids were the biggest disaster I ever did, but I, I don't have DNA testing, so I might not even be responsible. So I'm uh, I'm leaving that out for the jury. Um, so so well, first, I want to say one comment on the Fellowship Academy. Whenever I see someone who's a fellow of the Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry or has a really hot cosmetic practice, they're always hot. I, I mean, all, I mean, I lectured the other night in Scottsdale and there were a couple of uh, AACD guys there, uh, Rod Gore, I, I mean, I mean, I mean, they're, they're, you know, Dickerson, um, um, Hornbrook, uh, you know, all these guys. I've never seen a short, fat, bald guy crushing it in um, cosmetic dentistry, tummy tucks, boob jobs, facelifts, and that stuff. So do you, do, you think, uh, do you think it's a prerequisite to go into Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry Fellowship to at least be an eight on a one to 10? No, no, I think what's important is to take care of yourself and to, um, you know, even if you to stay trim and healthy and practice what you preach and have a good smile, um, work, working on yourself, because it's very difficult to encourage someone to engage in any sort of aesthetics when you yourself aren't taking care of yourself, whether that's, you know, something simple like teeth whitening or doing something more advanced. I do think it's important if to have a great smile if you're a dentist that's going to try to encourage people to get a great smile. I, I remember this is, you can say this, you can say this is what it did for me. So let it do that for you. So you're truly speaking from the heart um, versus trying to sell somebody something. I, I remember the stupidest thing I ever said in a, in a, in a class. I was, it was an 87. Jim Pride was lecturing in Phoenix. I, you know, I went there, I sat in the front rows. And he's telling me that anybody can sell cosmetic dentistry. So I innocently raised my hand. I think I was 24 years old. And I said, well, if, if it's, if anyone, you know, if it's so easy to sell cosmetic dentistry, how come you haven't got cosmetic dentistry? I mean, you have some of the worst teeth I've ever seen in my life. They're all brown and raggedy. And, and, then, and then I went to um, the, that, um, oh, what was that? Um, what was that boot camp in Texas? Um, uh, Haley's, Haley's boot camp. Oh, Walter, Walter Haley. Haley. Yeah, and yeah. it was the same thing. I mean, I think him and Jim Pride are probably the two most uncosmetic dentist people I've ever seen in my life, and they were always telling everybody to sell it. So I, I always called baloney on and said, well, it must not be really easy to sell if two of the most famous dentists on earth, Jim Pride and Walter Haley, uh, can't um, um, get it done. In fact, when I was there at, the, at Walter Haley's boot camp, um, Hornbrook was with me, David Hornbrook. And I remember David yeah. Hornbrook telling me at dinner, he said, dude, Come to San Diego, I'll fix your teeth for free. And he wouldn't yeah. even he wouldn't yeah. even go to San Diego to fix them for free. So I thought, okay, there, there must be more. So um, 
So tell us about what what is the journey to become a fellow of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry? If some some young dentist in dental school listening to you right now and says, "I want to be a, I, I want to make the top one hundred. What what do they have to do to become a fellow in the AACD? Well, first of all, you've got to join the AACD to start. And and I've met so many amazing like minded individuals that truly have pushed me to do better dentistry. And, you know, when you're at, together at meetings or talking on the phone, you say, hey, what, what lab are you using? What techniques are you using? And you're sharing ideas and thoughts. So surrounding yourself with a group of people that are like minded and have the same goals, I say I always say is very important in any aspect of life. But definitely if you want to do this AACD pathway um, when you're at the meetings going, there's a test you have to take online, obviously, to begin the process of submitting cases, but finding out about the accreditation process. You know, it seems daunting and people always think, oh, that's impossible. I don't ever want to have to submit 50 cases, but why not? You know, why not try at least? I mean, who hasn't failed at something, but then you just try again, right? So I'm a firm believer in just keep working at it. And you eventually, if that's your goal and you put a target at it and, and set deadlines for yourself, then it will, you can make it happen. You can make anything happen. We can make anything happen. Yeah, so it's just a it's just a it's a mindset. It's you know I never wanted to say hey because now everybody calls themselves a cosmetic dentist and really there's nothing else besides the AACD and it's making you submit cases without your name on them without the submission they have no idea who's sending in these cases in anonymously and there is a board of dentists that you know is is judging your work so I think you need to do that if you want to say I'm a cosmetic dentist. Okay, well, that's better advice than, than my advice. I was telling them if they want to be a black belt in karate, get their Eagle Scout or their fellowship in the AACD, you can buy all those on eBay. In fact, you might be able to buy them. Uh, I got my black belt in one hour on eBay. And uh, so, you know, one of the things I noticed about the, the AACD people, you're really big into the photography. But I always thought, you know, a lot of people, you know, um, um, a lot of people say, well, I, I don't want to do all that photography stuff, but I kind of see the digital camera as more important in 2019 as a CBCT and a CAD cam and all that stuff. Because these, when, when I was a little, only rich people, or if you work for the government, could fly in an airplane or a Fortune 500. Now with Southwest Airlines, who got their costs so low that everyone has the freedom to fly, I meet dentists all the time and they document all their work on their website and said, this is all my own work. And they're in Kansas City and people are flying to them from Omaha and St. Louis and they're flying over yeah. hundreds of dental offices that could do the exact same work. But you go to those dental offices, like it's so fun to be sitting at dinner with a guy and all he's talking about how much he loves implants and all he does is implants and he's got all these diplomas and everything and implants. And I go to his website right there and I'm like, dude, you don't have one case of an implant. Uh, so, so, so do you think the learn the AACD forcing you on those series of photographs has helped you with case presentation and marketing? The photos are so impactful and it's so wonderful to sit, you know, side by side with your patient and show them the photos. And, and honestly, it, it diagnoses so much dentistry. I love the occlusal shots because I tell people, this is like looking at your mouth from Google Earth. Like we're gonna go way out and just look at the big picture here. We're gonna see the occlusal wear. We're gonna see, you know, restorations breaking down. You can zoom in on things. It's, it's just, I love taking the AACD series of photos. It's how I begin all my new patient exams. Looking at the portrait, we take their profile shot. Can see a lot from the profile. You know, what does their mandible look like? What does their neck look like? What's their head posture? There's so many amazing pieces of information you can get from the photos. I mean, the AACD photos, the the lateral shots, not an AACD series. So I do take a few extra photos, but going through those photos is invaluable. Um, do you, does any camera work, or do you have a certain digital camera that you're in love with? I just use the Canon. I mean, if you call any of these big outfits, um, Photomed has some great, you know, some great options. Um, Norman Camera has some great options. Just call one of those guys and they'll set you up with all the settings and, and they'll even walk you through things. Norman Camera is amazing if, if you ever need help outside of, um, you know, work hours. There's always somebody available to help you. And, and what was his name? Norman what? No, it's Norman Camera. Norman, Norman Camera. camera. Yes, 
and there are, they have a few locations, but the Michigan is where their location okay. is that I contact. And I won't hold that against them being from Ohio. Now, um, but they're great. you know, one, one of the greatest advances in LVI and, and the AACD is, um, you know, I got out of school in 87. You know, my, uh, you know, I, I got out when uh, Fred Flintstone graduated the year behind me and all the cosmetic dentists <clears throat> at the time, I, I used to cringe on it because they would always file down all the upper 10 teeth for crowns. And then orthodontics came along and people started realizing minimally invasive dentistry and that came to a halt and everybody started uh, un unraveling all these teeth. I remember, I remember so many of those cases you had to do a root canals on the lateral incisors just to correct the rotation. But now it seems like no one is on top of their game in orthodontics if you're not combining um, bleaching bonding veneers with orthodontics. Do you agree? I agree. I, you know, I always take the easiest route, the simplest path. I, I don't, nobody wants to cut someone's teeth down. I, I truly treat their enamel as if it were mine. So, you know, I can't tell you the number of times the lab's like, uh, you're under reduced, you know, we need to think about how we want to change this, but it's tough to reduce tooth structure, but it's nice now with pre-planning these cases with digital smile design, and trying on the trial smile over their over their enamel, and then you can actually not have to prep the teeth or see only certain areas where you can even just use the disc to remove tooth structure. So overlaying the matrix on their existing dentition without touching a piece of tooth is the best way, and then you can know where to reduce from there instead of arbitrarily re using reduction guides. So I love all my cases. I try to do a trial smile and try it on over their teeth. And, and then we take pictures from there and see how the patient likes that. Wow, you so are- Christian Coachman, Chris, Christian Coachman has really done a great things in that area of dentistry. Yes, um, he has, and it's genetic with him too. Uh, I just, in fact, the last podcast I yeah. just did was uh, with a dentist from Brazil. Um, but um, okay. uh, Brazil's really, really into cosmic dentistry. We, we podcast interviewed uh, Christian Coachman uh, 186. He was a warm up for Tara. We uh, um, he he was the he was the opening band for you today. So when you said digital <laughs> smile design, what software is that merged with your Itero scanners? I know you um, use Itero scanners. What 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 software are you doing digital smile design with? So now there's an app for digital smile design. So you can use their app, or you can honestly a lot of times you can draw these lines. You can draw a lot of these lines in the old app that they used to have, just dragging pictures in and putting you know, lines on the face and following the curve of the arch. And then you send those to a lab and there's a lot of great labs out there that are designing digitally with software such as 3Shape. That's a big software they're using. So 3Shape is most familiar with the Trios people that have Trios scanner, ha usually have some sort of 3Shape software. But the labs have the 3Shape software. So we don't have that in our office but it's just, again, you scan the patient, you send them the photos, good photos, and they're gonna draw most of the lines for you and do a digital smile workup, or digital smile design workup. So, so you, then you they'll prefer, send you back. So, so you prefer yeah. using your iTero with the digitalsmiledesign.com? It doesn't really matter what scanner you use. They're all the same. I mean, you could use, you could use CareStream, it doesn't matter. You could, as long as you send it to a lab, that can take the the um, STL file, import it into the software, and then they can design something for you. And the cool thing is that you can end up getting these trial smiles back faster now with them sending us back an STL file and we can print it right in our office and then make a putty matrix and try it on the patient that day. But which, that's how quick, yeah, but, that's how quick the process is becoming. Now, are you, but I want to I want to pin you down on the software and the scanner just a little more because uh, I know that um, I know that the Align Technology owns Invisalign and Itero, and they were having some um, legal issues with Bio yeah. or, or Three Shape, and um, right. So, how does that affect you? I mean, in your office, are you doing more clear aligners with Three Shape Oral Scanner, or are you, which is what I call more of an open system, or are you in more of a closed system? with Itero and um, Invisalign and Align. So three, so three Shape is the software. Trios, Itero, CareStream, those are scanners. 
So it doesn't matter what scanner you choose to go through, but the issue with the TRIO scanner is that they will not, Invisalign will not accept, will not accept their scans. So that's the issue. If you do a lot of Invisalign through a line technology, then you would have to think twice about getting the TRIO scanner because they're not going to accept their scans. So, so, so that's why that's why I got the iTero because a lot of the cases I realign the teeth. Again, I'm not a fan of prepping. In fact, Dennis Wells. I don't know if you've ever met Dennis, but he's an amazing cosmetic dentist in Nashville, and uh, I had the good fortune of taking his course about ten years ago, and um, that's when I really got into no prep dentistry, no prep veneers. And it can be done really well. And a lot of guys say, "Oh no, it can't be done," but it truly can be done. Wow, that is uh, that that is so. It sounds like the Align Technology business model is working. I, I mean, um, it, it's causing people not to go to Three Shape if they they're not accepting their scans. I mean, if you, I mean, but now with with this now with the ability of being able to make your own aligners, and so you buy a printer and you use another. Um, a software company that will actually design the teeth already and you can just suck it down in your office with one of those really great suck down machines from Great Lakes. So you print the model, the series, and so you'll have a series of, of um, you know, retainers that you'll give the patient just like you would if you were paying the fee from a line. You can make your own aligners. A lot of orthodontists are making their own aligners in office now with the capabilities of printing and then having the machine to suck it down. Is that a goal of yours? Is that something you plan on doing? I don't really have the time to, you know, I, I have the CEREC technology in my office and, you know, I, I, I did one today, but I, I, I'm not a fan of having to spend that extra time. And I feel like the restorations are not as aesthetic as what my lab can produce for me. And, you know, if you're really doing aesthetic dentistry, I, I just, unless you take like, James Clem's course or one of these courses and you're sitting there staining. I mean, can you imagine me sitting there staining and glazing in the middle of the day? I, I just well, I mean, it's, it's not that. a very scalable business model. I mean, I mean, if you graduate from lawnmower school and you push a lawnmower from age 25 to 65, that's not nearly as much money as if you own a, a team of five people that one guy's got a lawnmower, a weed eater, a blower. I mean, it's just not very scalable to do all your stuff. When I see these courses, where people are saying, oh yeah, buy a CEREC machine and I do all my veneer cases with it. I'm like, really? Oh. You do all your veneer cases with a CEREC machine? Uh, I, I don't know how your um, the dentist or the dental assistant could be as bad as as amazing as a lab who just does it full time. I I, I, yeah. I don't say that. Well, well, let's switch to crowns. So, so for posterior crowns, um, are you scanning and sending them to a lab? Are you taking polyvinyl siloxane? Are you doing chair-side milling with a CEREC machine? What, what, what's a, that, that when, when I look at insurance data, there's 32 teeth, and you look at all the claims, it's just four big spikes on the first, uh, on the six-year molars. I mean, what's the tooth most yeah. likely to be crowned, root canal, extracted, implant? So I just I want to pin you, hold your feet down to just the four first year molars. When someone comes in and needs a first molar, uh, three, fourteen, nineteen, thirty, what? How do you? How are you doing a crown on that tooth? Lab, so chair side I'm milling. Doing, I'm doing, I'm doing a an itero scan, a modelless posterior scan. So the lab's producing a modelless restoration that comes back in a box, no, no, no model at all. So I scan the tooth, I pack cord always, scan the tooth, send them a great scan, and then they send back a restoration in about two weeks, Emacs bonded on the first molars. And which lab are you Emacs using? Is my, I use Utah Valley. Actually, I use David Hornbrook's lab. They do a beautiful job, oh, they do great they work. I I, yeah, I knew David, Richard yeah, David's a Richard of mine. Wiles own, owns it, right? Richard I, Wiles. I don't know. I I speak to JD. I know Kent is now the head lab guy over there, who's really easy to you work say JD with. Or JD or JD. 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 Oh, yeah, Jeff. JD. Jeff Henderson. Jeff JD Henderson. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and Hornbrook. Yeah, he's wonderful. He's wonderful. Kent is so great. He's new to the lab, doing an awesome job. They're they're really, really wonderful people to work with. And uh, Hornbrook's uh, he's their uh, dentist now for a long time. It, you know, I don't know how long he's been their 
and I don't know the exact relationship. I know there's ownership, but obviously I don't know his, but their spokesman, if you will. I don't know. I would say a couple of years now. I, I always wanted to own my own lab, but I could never meet a single chick that owned a lab uh, that was willing to marry me. I, I figured that was the best way to get into the lab business. Um, so uh, yeah, labs, um, I, 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 I don't know. I, I, the, the market has spoken. I mean, CAD CAM was out when I was in dental school. I was in dental school, 84 to 87. And the French were the ones that were spending all the heavy lifting dollars on uh, CAD CAM because uh, it was socialized medicine and they thought the government could save all this money on lab bills by having all this. So, but anyway, long story short, you know, I, I've been a dentist for 31 years and I don't even think 15% of crowns are being chair side milled. Um, I, I think what's going to be a lot bigger is what you're doing, which is scanning the tooth and sending the scan to a lab. And but, but what if right. some was what if some young dentist just got out of dental school is asking, um, well, what's the difference really between an iTero scan and sending it to a Utah Dental Lab uh, versus just an Impergum impression? What what would you tell her? Well, I mean you're getting with an itero scan you're getting down to five microns of accuracy i don't know what impergum i mean i hear it tastes bad and i've never used it in private practice so i know there's still prosthodon is using it but i've no, i don't use it so well, it, used to, it used time, to be made by i Espy. doubt it's i'm sorry it, it was made it was a german company um Espy, I and, and then 3m bought it uh, three and bought it, but I remember you had to squirt the two lines and mix it right on the mixing pad. I don't know. Maybe they have it out of a gun now. I, I don't know. No, I think you're thinking, thinking about use... rubber base. Oh, probably. I, I need to have, I, I I need to have two use... podcasts, one for senior citizen dentist and then one for all the millennials. I mean, they probably, we probably don't make a lot of sense. Oh my God. I wish, I wish <laughs> I was a millennial. Well, if you, if you graduate. Technically, you are millennial because the definition of millennial is that you were coming to age at the year 2000. In 2000, you just walked out of dental school. I mean, that, that was, that was you, you were coming to age in 2000, I would say. Yeah, I guess I was, I was coming to age, coming into my career. Coming into your career. Um, so you also got into airway and breathing. Um, why and um, what, 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 what motivated you to get into airway and breathing? Talk us about your journey of how that gotten your path well I'm, I'm part of this mastermind group and it's just random dentists from around the country that kind of form together several of us had been to LVI and different places and we do an annual meeting every year and everybody talks on you know what's their hot topic like you know my hot topic was doing layering composites and you know other people their hot topic was airway and breathing this is back years ago and so I started it, I had a lot of interest in that too because I know the importance of breathing and you take any of these courses and you can't believe the amount of people with obstructive sleep apnea and what they're predicting the future to be as we become a more obese society um, there's going to be more issues with it and so really making sure and 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 developing young people their airway at an early age you know kids that are thumb suckers kids that um, besides sucking their thumb, um, you know, have tonsillar issues. They have, they need to be breathing through their nose. It's so critical. And so um, when the research that you learn about, you think, oh my God, are we, are we dying an early death by not getting oxygen to our brain and to our heart and to all the areas of our body? You say, I need to make sure when I'm, a, as a dentist, that I'm screening them, blood pressure screenings, looking at their medications, looking at their airway and saying, what's going on here? Is the reason there's so much occlusal wear, could it be related to the fact they have obstructive sleep apnea? So sometimes you gotta get to the root cause of the issue and not just treat the problem. You know, we see rampant caries and what do we do? We drill a hole in everybody's tooth and we pack it with filling material. Is that really gonna last if we don't talk about acidity, sugar, bacteria? It's, it's not gonna work. You got to dig into what is the root cause of all of these issues. You know, one of the reasons, um, you know, in 2004, we started the online CE on Dental Town. We got 450 courses. They've been viewed almost a million times. And the reason I started this podcast was because the one thing I've noticed in 31 years of being a dentist, 
People like you, all the people at the top, the first thing that, that differentiates them from everyone else is they're addicted to CE. I mean, you're in a mastermind group. You got your fellowship in the AGD. You got your fellowship in the Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. What it is in my mind is you, you talked about, you know, the, the, the joining the ACD and hanging out with all these like-minded people. If you immerse yourself in a lot of CE, you immerse yourself in a lot of other successful dentists, all this stuff is thrown against the wall. Something's gonna stick. Whether you fall in love with the AACD or implant dentistry or, or sleep apnea, or it doesn't matter. You'll just be motivated, something will stick, and then you'll get really good and really successful at something. Um, I can't believe, um, it's embarrassing uh, to be with a bunch of dentists at a table and listen to some guy complaining that to renew his license, he has to go get 12 hours of continuing education. Oh. And it's like, dude, you should get 12 hours of continuing education on a weekend several times a year. So I want you to talk about that young kid. She's 25. She just walked out of dental school. She's $400,000 in debt. And she's saying, Tara, I, I, I don't want to spend any money on C. I, I don't want to go see Coise. I don't want to go see Coachman. I don't want to go to LVI. I, I want to, I, I want to, you know, eat ramen noodles and pay down my student loans. Well, I, I, my advice would be to, you know, the first thing they do is they get out and they think they should drive a Mercedes and spend money on a car and some fancy stuff. And if you invest in yourself and your education, the rewards will be much greater, maybe not immediately, but further down the road. So it's really important for these young dentists to um, get with a, an advisor and, and I, that's, you got to be careful with that word when you say a planner or somebody that's going to look at their debt load and figure out how can we pay this back and which one should we pay back faster and but yet still spend money on my education and me and a lot of things can be done online finding a great mentor in this arena in this field i mean we want to help people i had a young dentist call me and i was honored you know she was just out of school and she said i'm going to visit dennis wells practice i'm going to visit your practice i'm going to go see deborah gray king in atlanta and i said of course come spend two days with my family she stayed at my house and um, I thought, what a smart kid, you know, what a go getter um, to think about that, you know, because obviously I'm not, no one's going to charge her to have her, them come, have her come and stay with us and visit our practices. So we just want to help. I mean, we want to grow. I, I want to keep the sole proprietor dentist alive. I, I, it hurts me when I see these big DSOs coming in and they've got buying power that we can't touch. They can buy scan for half the price we can buy scanners they buy supplies half we can buy supplies and i'm waiting for someone like you howard to ban us all together and say okay let's hire a really smart person that can negotiate these rates for us and keep the sole proprietor dentist alive that's what needs to happen in our industry but young people we want to help i mean any person wants to call me and come to my practice for a day they're welcome to come and hang out that is beyond cool. I, I want. Um, so, why do you think it's important for solo practitioners to be the delivering business model as opposed to everyone working at uh, Heartland or Aspen or a DSO or Pacific Dental, something like that? It, it's so simple because when you own your own business, you have your own practice. You care more than anybody else and you really do and you care about reviews and all of it hurts you know you want to do the best always and i feel like when you're just an employee somewhere it's not the same it's not the same well uh, and I think every every dental practice management consultant i've had on this show that goes in and does office does they always say the same thing the owner at a seminar they're in the front row taking notes the associates on snapchat or instagram uh, when they go in the office um you know the owner dentist is all motivated and the associates aren't um i and i, I and i also think it's a um it's a it's almost like a natural selection so all the people that all are they're all in, you know, they, they, they committed to the, the debt. They're all in. They usually end up in private practice owning, working for themselves, which natural selection leaves over a lot less motivated people to become employees. And, and all, right. and I just don't see many people making money off associate dentists just because they're not motivated to take all the CE, go in these mastermind groups, take, you know, get their fellowship and the AACD and the AG, everything you did, was kind of what you see more of in an owner-operated model. 
Uh, whereas when you get to an employee model, it's more like they're watching the clock and, you know, trying, you know, so, so I, I think it's structurally going to be really interesting to watch. But since you're um, one of only 82 fellows in the American Academy of Cosmic Dentistry, I want to answer still more questions for the young kids. Um, again, I'm only talking about six year olds because when you get out of school, that's not when you do an anterior veneer case and all on four. I mean, it's like if you want to win the Super Bowl, you're going to have to do a, a block, a tackle, a pass, a catch, and all the dentistry is done on four six-year molars. And she's wondering, uh, you just said Emacs on a first-year molar. Does it matter? I mean, what about Bruxer? If I'm Bruxer, um, I, I can just see Menet. Uh, if I do Emacs, so I got a bond. Use- so Bruxer, yeah, of course you can do a Bruxer on a first on a first molar, but it, aesthetically, I wouldn't want a Bruxer on my first molar. So, and especially if it's a female and she has a large smile on an upper first molar, you better believe she's going to see it. I mean, how many smiles have you seen ruined by PFMs in the posterior on the first molar? So, you know, I just think the opacity of the Bruxer for, um, you know, first molar, unless there's really severe occlusal issues would i do that so i mean you're, what's, so you're when saying, you've got when you so got you're, when you're getting 500 megapascals of strength do you need 900 i mean how do you, what on a little what if it's a female i mean do you need 900 megapascals of strength i i i do believe what you're saying is that if it's a man with the liver spot use zirconia and if it's uh, a woman use uh emax lithium disilicate why well, don't mean- no, that's terrible. That sounded so bad. That's what you said. That. That's what you said. <laughs> that is not what I said. <laughs> but if it's in a, a female on a first molar upper, I'm not going to do a Bruxer. I can tell you that. So. And I want to tell you don't. really solid advice. And I don't know if Tara will agree or not, but in my in my career, uh, when I wanted to do a cosmetic case, if she was if she was beautiful female, high lip line or whatever. I, I didn't want that case. I mean, I got a, some AACD right. people. I should, um, when, when you're doing dentistry, like like I'm in Phoenix, there's a lot of retirees in Phoenix. I'm in Ahwatukee, it's a third retiree. I mean, man, if they got a liver spot, I don't even pull out a shade guide. I just say, you know, A35. You know, I mean, I don't, I can't imagine anybody saying, ah, this tooth doesn't match my liver spot. Uh, but man, when you start getting into some high intense, uh, beautiful women with high expectations. Satisfaction equals perception of what just happened minus what I expected. So to be a good dentist, you have to lower their expectations. Uh, and you know that's why I say you know when I, whenever I pull a tooth, they say you know this be so will this be sore afterwards? Well, you say no, you'll be fine. My God, any soreness at all, yeah. you blew their expectations. I always I always say you know when, when this thing wears off. I hope you got a bottle of whiskey and a pistol because you're probably going to want to shoot yourself. And, uh, you know, and I, I, I prepare them for just death. And then they always come back. You're going to say, say lower, yeah, and then lower they, the expectations. Oh, lower yeah. Lower the expectations. Like, like when a girl yeah. says to me, she goes, well, they break the front teeth. well, can you make a match the other one? I always say, well, well, God made that one. And I don't, no one so far has ever called me God. So, uh, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a walking monkey. Uh, I, I'll do it really, really good. You know, I got my fellowship and, the, yeah. and my mastership. They, I'll, I'll try, but uh, so I always lower the expectations. And then you can see in her face that she's like, "Oh damn, this is my front tooth." I, I take five Instagram pictures a day, so you really lower their expectation. And then when you nail it and you hand them the mirror, and they look at it they're like, "Oh my god, oh my god!" And, and that's the I tell, I tell them five try-in appointments. Five try-in appointments. For a single tooth, central. Because if I nail it the second time, or if I nail it the first time, I'm a hero. Wow. Yeah, that's all. Uh, yeah, same thing root canals. I, I I know dentists that sit there and say, oh, yeah, I never prescribe pain pills. Um, You know, you shouldn't have any discomfort after a root canal. Yeah, yeah. And you'll need new patients the rest of your life because all these people are getting a root canal <laughs> saying, my God, he said it wouldn't hurt at all. And it hurt like hell. So just lower their, and every time I pull a tooth, I don't know, do you like blood and guts? Do you like extractions? I, I do very infrequently, but I do do it. I, I do it. Always, I took a tooth out today. I always hold the root in front of their face. No matter what the root looks like, I hold it and I say, look at the curve on that thing. That thing curved <laughs> up behind your cheekbone, damn near grew in your eye. I swear to God, when this thing wears off, 
hopefully you'll be able to shoot yourself because this is going to be horrible. And and they're just prepared for the worst. And then I'm their hero yeah. because you lower their expectation. So beware of the. In fact, they even got a show. I watched a, a, an episode when I was at my son's house. Something about some plastic surgeon guy redoing other people's work. And it's called botched. It's called botched. Yeah, and uh, B-O-T-C-H-E-D. my Botched. gosh, so so treatment plan presentations, a lot of stuff. Um, so do you think uh, I want to ask you another question because you're really in a you're you're in the reddest state. I mean, I was born and raised in Kansas, went to Creighton and Nebraska, dental school in Missouri. You're in Ohio, which is pr- pretty much ground zero for middle red state America. Is Invisalign a brand where they come in and they say, Dr. Harden, I want Invisalign, or can you switch them to clear aligner? They, they just want whiter, brighter, sexier teeth, or is it really brand sensitive? Like, like, like anytime you order Coke and they'll say, well, is Pepsi okay? I mean, do you have to say, is Pepsi okay if they ask for Invisalign? They never come in. They, they don't know. They don't necessarily ask for the brand. In fact, what's becoming the rage now, I'm sure you're familiar, is Candid Co., and Smile Direct Club. So, you know, people are, I have physicians coming to me and saying, here, take a look at my uh, video they sent me of what my smile could look like if I did this. And the ironic part about this case that was presented to me is she was missing about 20% of the incisal edge of her tooth, and they just extruded the tooth for the incisal edges to match up. So it was really uh, funny for me to see a case, I mean, not funny, I said to her, I tried to explain to her that part of her tooth was missing and that she would be actually self-extracting if she went with their treatment plan. Um, But yeah, I don't think that these companies should be doing, um, I think a lot of bites are going to be not treated correctly. There's going to be some TMD that's going to result, broken teeth down the road, and they're going to be coming to the dentist saying, can you fix this for me? So I'm not a huge fan of, of patients practicing dentistry, you know, in their own home. I think it needs to be, needs to be monitored. But I think um, competition is great for any industry. And some of the numbers, you know, sure. e- e- if, if I'm wrong on my numbers, if I say something I'm wrong, email me Howard at dentaltown.com or put the notes in the comment under the YouTube video. But you know, what I keep hearing and, and a lot of my information, you know, there's a lot of publicly traded companies like Invisalign's publicly traded. Sure. Um, Smiles sure. Drug Club's doing an IPO. Uh, Strawman sells the most implants in the world because uh, they bought, you know, Neodent in Brazil. They bought MIS, make it simple in, in Israel. Um, but what I'm reading and what Wall Street's reading is that Ortho is basically 6,500 bucks, only 5% of Americans got it. So if someone comes on the scene like Smiles Drug Club and can get the cost down to say 2,500, th- th- you would think easily that price elasticity, if, if 6,500 got 5%, I would think 2,500 would get another 10 to 20%. And I think that's what Wall Street's gonna think and they'll probably walk out of there with a billion dollar valuation. But that, that competition's good for America, it's good for the patient, the dentist, because what it means is, you, can you squeeze cost out? And when I look at ortho, you know, maybe you don't need to see the patient every month. Maybe you can see them every other month. Maybe you can see them every third month. I mean, because what Smiles Drug Club is doing, they're just going to give them all their trays at one time. That might be a little extreme and it's not supervised by a doctor or dental surgery like I would want my children or my grandchildren to be supervised. But I do think it's going to co- uh, make everyone think about how can I squeeze costs out of this orthodontic procedures so that I can do more of them. Do you agree with that or disagree? I, I see ortho, they're making orthodontics be a commodity. And as you said early on in the conversation, you know, not all orthodontists are created equal. And, and some of the ortho you see is not good. And they're treating early, the second molars aren't even in occlusion when they're finishing these cases. Some of them are partially erupted. And then I see them five years later and their second molars are super erupted and their upper seconds aren't in. So their lower seconds are now super erupted, their uppers aren't even in. So I think it's really important to not make dentistry a commodity because it's not. And the skill of the technician and when you're doing ortho, you're doing a full mouth rehabilitation really. Every tooth needs to work with the opposing and you know creating discrepancies in the bite and, and other issues. I, I just I don't, I don't see it as, as being um, good for any of us. But I, I understand what you're talking about with the business model, but as far as the treatment and the end result for patients, I don't think it's there. 
Now, um, or- ortho has changed so much. I mean, when I got out of school, there, there were orthodontists in town, but almost over three-fourths of their patients had four bicuspid extraction. And now oh. those guys are down to about one-fourth. Um, and then the other th- there thing should, I've noticed. There should be zero. It should be zero. It should be zero. If, if given the choice, I would say on my kids, you know, my kids are, the ages were wrong. They're 12, 11, and 9. But my kids' ages, the youngest one is is very crowded. She's got big teeth that have come in. And the orthodontist said, gosh, Tara, for, as, as against bicuspid extractions you are, she might be one. And I said, I will leave her teeth crooked before I would do a four bicuspid extraction because she's going to be a big kid. My husband is 6'6", six, six, and I'm never going to narrow her airway, never going to narrow her airway. And that, that that is the problem is when you take those teeth out and narrow the dental arches, the tongue has nowhere to go but back. So I shouldn't say narrow the airway, but narrow her dental arches that then narrow the tongue spacing. That's a problem. You can't narrow the space for the tongue. Can yeah. only go back. Your husband is six foot six. Is he? Is his name Leif Erikson? Was he a, a Viking? No, no, he's one hundred percent Irish. He's Irish is six six. I think a Viking must have landed in Ireland a thousand years ago. Uh, that is a huge. No. That is a huge man. Um, but yeah, that, it's interesting. And and the other thing about um, when I was little, a lot of four by cuspid extraction. You know, I got five sisters, and due to HIPAA, I'm not allowed to say my older sister Jean Marie had that. Um, but um, the the other thing I've noticed is that when we were little, you just got the family could just afford ortho like one time, and you just did it for that right. one kid at that one time. But now it seems like. They're getting ortho, um, they're getting um, preventative uh, um, interceptive ortho by a pediatric phase, dentist. Phase one. Phase one, they're getting ortho at the orthodontist. But man, they're back in your chair at 35, 55. Um, do you also see a lot of post-divorce cleanup? It seems like when they uh, when when they uh, they, they ditch their uh, their Viking uh, man and they're back on the market, they, they're, they're back into bleaching, bonding ortho again. Do you see that a lot as a fellow of the AACD? I, I do have to say there is a trend of people trying to look more youthful. That's what I'm going to say. People are trying to look more youthful. I don't know why they do that. So, why don't they just, uh, you know, why don't they just cut and paste some fancy movie stars picture on their uh, Tinder? Uh, what is it? Tinder? <laughs> swipe left, swipe right. Can, I, I can, don't, just, can they just bring in a photo to you and you can Photoshop it and upload it straight to Plenty of Fish and Match.com so they don't have to go through all this probably. stuff? But, uh, but yeah, so I, I think that's another thing that, um, I, the, the thing I'm saying about ortho, this, I'm going to say it more succinctly. Um, if you're young and you're coming out of school, $400,000 in debt, there's going to be a lot of upward demand for ortho, clear aligners, and implants. No matter yeah. where I, I've lectured in 50 countries, I, I don't care if you go to Cambodia, Malaysia, Brazil, in South Africa, Tunisia, anywhere I've lectured, the, the 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 people the seven and a half billion earthlings are wanting more implants and then when you read some of these publicly traded uh statements from like um oh say strawman they're the the largest supplier of dental implants they they have a list on their uh website of all the countries of how many implants they place per hundred thousand and the united states doesn't even make oh, the top 20. so so wall wow. street looks at that and say god if the american dentist place as many implants per 10,000 people as they do in Korea and Germany and a whole bunch of other countries, that market's going to double or explode. So, so my succinctly, I want to ask you that if they're coming out of school, um, you're a master of uh, cosmetic dentistry. Sell, sell why she should go that way instead of placing implants. Or, or um, do you don't place implants, do you? You know, it's it's what your passion is, and you have to be passionate about whatever area of dentistry that really intrigues you because you're going to get really good at it. And my firm belief in dentistry is that there's a book called The One Thing, and I love that book, and it just says focus on something and just get really good at it and, and be the best in your trade at it. And so I, I think just finding what area of dentist, if it's implantology, then get you know, learn to do guided surgeries. You're going to need a CBCT machine. Make sure you're doing, placing those implants. If you're going to be a general dentist, place those implants better than the oral surgeon that says, I don't need a guide or better than the periodontist that says, I don't need a guide. So if you're going to be a general dentist, get really, really good 
add placing implants if that's what you love. If you love cosmetics, then train in cosmetics and get really great at that. But whatever area you choose, just become your best at it and you will succeed. Well, we'll talk, I, I agree with you because, oh my God, what a perfect segue to my next question. I can't believe you said the one thing is I see these dentists and they, you know, 1900, there were no specialties. And by 2000, the physicians had 58 and the dentists had nine. And now I meet these young kids in school. And they're like, well, I want to, I want to get really good at molar endo and Invisalign and veneers and placing implants and bone grafting and sinus lifts. And, and I'm like, dude, we're not going back to the 1900. You can't, right. ma- I mean, I know endodontists in my backyard that it's everything they've got just to master every single thing about endodontics. Sure. And then the pediatric True. dentist True. and silver diamine flora. And so, yeah. so I like, so talk about this one thing that, that made you, uh, the one thing, the surprisingly simple truth behind extraordinary results by Gary Keller. Um, that, that sounds like that was a big impact on you. It, it was a big impact. I mean, I, again, that's the whole, we talked about um, choosing which pathway and, and why, I wanted to become a cosmetic dentist, but getting, making sure it's your passion and then getting really good at it and being warranted to be called a cosmetic dentist. If you want to call yourself an implantologist, well then do everything to show that you are, you should be called an implantologist. So I, I really enjoyed it and I, everybody should have a focus and maybe you do two things really, really well, but I think when you do 10 things, you're the jack of all trade and the master of nothing, right? Right, and I think what um, what you're also say um, is so true that you know I always get that question about you know should I should I specialize and I'm like you know should I be a pediatric dentist? They'll say that looks like it's a hot growth, and I say well if I was a pe- if I had a choice between being a pediatric dentist and being the Taco Bell night manager, uh, I would I would be the Taco Bell night manager. I mean I would rather probably go to hell than than do that so i i think they should specialize in something they're passionate about i always ask them it's your life you only live one time and everybody is uh, uh retires in the same uh uh size grave so why, why don't you do uh what what you like exactly no that, that's exactly the way i feel and well, uh said. so uh, any other uh, uh takeaways from the book the one thing I mean, I, my new book is um, uh, Morning Miracle. Have you heard of that? No, Morning really Miracle. Great. And what, what is Morning it? Miracle. And, and I can't remember his last name, but his first name is Hal. But I've been listening to that every morning. And uh, he, it's really been, I, I put it on Audible on my phone because I've listened to it on my way to work. Um, but, you know, put it on your bedside or whatever. But it, it's really an inspiring story. And it's, it's uh, you know, I'm not even halfway through, but it's really getting me motivated to to get my focus and spending time in the morning uh, working out exercising you know we got to take better care of ourselves today and you know as dentists we work really hard we need to take better care of ourselves physically as well as with our food intake and there's just a lot of areas that we need to we just need to be working on improvement self-improvement um, and all the rest follows you know it's it's amazing when you work on yourself what the results are the Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod. Hal Elrod. Yep. And he's got a review. Uh, it's recommended by Robert Kiyosaki, best-selling author, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, uh, who lives up the street. I'm here. Um, so, so yeah. So, so follow your passions. Get addicted to uh, continuing education. By, by the way, in a lot of these countries I've been take to. Take good care of yourself. Take, take good care of yourself. Eat well. Yes. Eat right. Don't do drugs. I never, one of my other policies, I never drink ever during the work week never because i want to have a really clear focused mind so i just think that patients deserve 110 percent from us and that we need to give it to them and deliver getting good rest sleeping right all those things are super important but then uh but then when it comes to the weekend then what do you drink <laughs> no <laughs> no even weekends but everything in moderation i say just but Taking good care of yourself, I think, is is really important today. Okay, so I'm going to go. You don't because if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. Right, health is wealth, and and um, that that is a, an interesting thing. Like it was the Mayo. You know, I'm out here in Phoenix, Arizona, which has a uh, Mayo Clinic, and they uh, they were Rochester, but they they put one in uh, Florida and uh, Phoenix. And it was the Mayo Brothers who first really realized in healthcare that. 
Um, when people are going down, they will pay for the best. And, and it didn't make sense because right. it'd be like an 85 year old grandma who'd been on a wheat farm her whole life. And the Mayo brothers were shocked that the family was willing to sell her entire farm life for, they, they, they'd wow. sell it all to save grandma. But you, you know, you look at grandma, 85 years old with some terminal disease, you would think, well, the best thing to do is just take her to the vet and put her down. Uh, but that's not how people work. They're like, no, save grandma, even if it's a million dollars. And, and if and yeah. I love that book, Health Versus Wealth. I mean, once you lose your health, you have nothing. So that's why when you see this amazing wealth, in fact, I, I just uh, uh, published this day, everybody's doing the 10 year challenge. You've been hearing the 10 year challenge. Um, where they're, you know, they're showing a picture of themselves 10 years ago. And today, uh, I, I like, yeah, the, yeah. I, I like the world's 10 year challenge in 2008, extreme poverty was 21%. Now it's only 8% child mortality in 2008 was 6%. Now it's 4%. Youth illiteracy was 11%. Now it's 8%. And life expectancy has gone from 69 to 72. So as these countries get rich and you got 20 countries with almost all the money, and as those countries get rich, what do they do? They bid up the price for healthcare, clean water, mm -hmm. clean air. I mean, could you imagine in World War II when America was trying to knock off, you know, Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany, if you would have been out there saying that you wanted to save all the butterflies in Ohio? I, I mean, I mean, no, no one cared about the lakes and rivers right. in Ohio when you got Nazi Germany that just rolled over Poland. Um, but now that we've had peace for so long and we're so wealthy, it's so refreshing to see all these young people that really are concerned about global warming and trash in the oceans and all these things. But what they don't realize is those are only luxury items that really rich people can want. Because once you lose all of the economy and all that kind of stuff. It's just war. And then it's not about a matter of, are you growing your economy two and a half percent? Like, like a lot of people complain that America from 1980 to 2020 basically has a 30, a uh, 40 year trend rate of only growing their GDP two and a half percent a year. Well, how would it like to be Germany during World War One and World War Two when their economy was going down 50%? I mean, when you go in there and wipe out an entire country. So, so the, these are these are really good luxury problems to have. Take care of yourself, um, surround yourself with good people, audit. I always say, I'm gonna say the reverse of what she said. She, she said, join the AACD to surround yourself with good people. That's so true. But you also, at the same time, audit out your dentist friends who hate dentistry, think dentistry right. is a bad case. You don't need that evil, sick stuff in your mind when people are telling them. I have to correct you. I have to correct you. You said good people. I said like-minded people. I, all people are good people in our profession. It's just like-minded people, not just good people. Because I don't want anyone to come say, oh, Tara said everybody from the AACD is good people. <laughs> they are great people, but we're all great people. Yeah, and, and just because you're not part of it, but you need to be part of it. I think, you know, keep keeps going. But I, it, it's true. It's finding people that are like you, getting rid of your friends that say dentistry this is the worst profession ever, or just negative people in general, because you need people that bring you up and lift you up. Yeah, and that also includes family. Some people, some dentists I know, yeah. the most toxic person in their life is in their immediate family. And it's like, dude, I yeah. don't care that you and your brother shared the same condo the first nine months of life. You know, he, you, you don't, you don't, you don't need to be sharing his condo anymore. I mean, just negative, yeah. negative, negative. Last but not least, I, I can't believe we went yeah. over an hour. Can I have one overtime question? Sure. She's 25. She just graduated from dental school, whether it was AT still in Mesa or Midwestern in Glendale, she's $400,000 in debt. She's working at a DSO, Aspen, Heartland, whatever. And she keeps thinking one day I'm going to grow up and be like Tara and own my own office. What would you say to her? I mean, she's kind of in a comfort zone. She, she's making 150 grand a year. She sees you. She obviously would rather be you in your state than where she is right now. What advice would you give her to, to cross the chasm of, I mean, it's kind of like crossing the Grand Canyon. She's got to go all the way down, cross the Colorado River and climb all the way back out to be where you are. What advice would you give her? You have to find somebody, find a great mentor, find someone that's willing to take you under their wing and help you grow as a person and grow your business. And so I think if this individual found the right person that said, you know, 
I really don't want to sell out to a DSO. I want someone to come into my practice and then and teach them because let's face the facts, you can't practice forever. So some people think they can, but you know, I I do things at a high level of detail and I'm not gonna continue to do dentistry well into my late sixties when my eyesight's not as good and I feel my level of detail has has you know fallen, you know, going out on top. So I think there are dentists out there that wanna complete their career and they want to pass the baton and dentistry has been such a gift to me that I want to give that gift to someone else. And so finding just the right person that, and they could be, you might have to move somewhere. Um, you might not be able to say in the state of Colorado, which you love so much or wherever it is, you might have to travel to find this office, a unique situation, but finding someone that wants to support you and help you and, and grow yourself because you are in a debt situation and that's going to be tough to get out of um, without some support. And uh, I think you need a, a great mentor or group of mentors even to help you help you get there. Well, that's Dr. Tara Harden, DDS, FAGD, FAACD, one of only 82 fellows of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. It was an honor to podcast you today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. The honor was mine. Thank you. I oh, appreciate oh, oh, it. Oh, will you... Will, um, would you ever consider writing an article for Dental Town Magazine or an online CE course? Of course, I'd be happy to. Those the millennials they they um we put up 450 one hour courses on Dental Town. They've been viewed almost a million times. They um uh, they love just crawling up on their iPad and putting in their 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 i their earphones or whatever the hell they do. And uh, they, they love that hours uh, segment thing. And uh, they love uh, podcasts when they're commuting to work. I'm sorry if you've been on the Stairmaster this whole time. I hope you've uh, already got off and you're at the <laughs> finishing this podcast at the bar eating some fried uh, cheese balls and a beer. But but yeah, if you if you made a uh, an online C course, it would it would just be so amazing and, and it raised the, uh, the 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 um, you know the value of Dental Town Online C. I mean, it'd be a real honor to have a course on the online CE from you. Okay, well let me know a content and what, what, you, what you'd like to hear about more about and I'd be happy uh, to take care of it. No, I'm gonna answer that with your own question. I, I want you to do a course on what you're most passionate about. Well, my course on what? Bonding, aesthetic dentistry, bleaching, what, which portion? We'll take Internal them all, bleaching. we'll take which them all. Which topic, which topic do you want? Oh, you want me to continue? Oh, hell yeah. The, the Howard, you missed? You missed the part of the 12, 11, and uh, eight-year-old and um, uh, running a full-time practice with 11 ops and uh, 10 employees. And on that note, guess what? I am so excited. Guess what I get to do after work today? My four boys what? are 21, 23, 25, 28, and we're all four going to dinner tonight in Phoenix. I'm so excited. I know That's you awesome. think when they're, they're that age that it's the most fun age, but it just gets better every single year. I'm actually, Aww. when my when my four boys were your kids' age, I always thought, ah, it's gonna be over soon, and I'd, I'd get sad thinking it's about to be over. Hell, it's more fun in their 20s than it was in, in their teens. So, uh, so have fun. That's with really great. That's great to hear. That's really fun. That's that's awesome. And I'm such a role model for them because I, they always, the more time I spend with them, they know exactly what not to do. So uh, I'm, right. there, uh, I'm there, don't be like dad, and then they'll, they'll be successful. So have fun with your kids tonight. Tell your husband I said hello, and thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. All right, bye-bye.